my left, there he is. Uh, he is a vegan science YouTuber based in the US and he regularly debunks the myths that magnify harmful dietary and lifestyle behaviours with the added bonus of his great sense of humour. There you go. His YouTube channel has over 325,000 subscribers and he's got over 30.5 million views. Mike the Vegan! So many of you, you're all so beautiful, sexy vegans. Maybe some nerdy vegans here too, yeah? Nerdy vegans cheering for science, yes? I say nerdy, you say vegan. Nerdy! Vegan! Nerdy! Vegan! I, yeah, okay, I just wanted to do that, okay. So this is how the numbers turned me vegan. As you probably know, I'm all about science and the numbers, and really, when I, when I wasn't vegan yet, I was a little stubborn. I was like, ah, you know, maybe I need an ounce of fish every four months, otherwise I'm gonna, you know, shrivel in, up and get a protein deficiency. And I just needed to read all of the research to know for myself. And so, the numbers really did turn me vegan, as well as Lindy here in the front. Round of applause for Lindy. Vegan 12 years, kicking butt. So numbers matter, but feelings also matter a lot. Um, so I, I was just so stubborn about it, and I just felt like I needed all the details, so I researched more and more and more and more, and then I eventually did it. So it was sort of, you know, I didn't want to be vegan, but after reading all the research and going through it, the numbers haunted me at night, and eventually I was like, okay, I gotta do it. You know, there's no excuse. I don't need, I don't need the lysine from it's from animals, I could get it from plants. I don't need this and that. We're gonna get into all of that. But, you know, that's where, that's where I'm at. And so, this is why numbers matter. Because a lot of people, especially nowadays over in my territory called the United States of America, we don't really care about facts as much as we probably should. And so, so the, really the reality is though, at least for me, somebody who likes intellectual things, and I think, I think a good portion of the population of humanity is somewhat intellectually, you know, persuadable. And so I say, along with sound logic, numbers from good sources, number good, from good sources are our best shot at finding the truth. And I say good sources because that's why I really started my YouTube channel, because I went on, you know, vegan YouTube and just saw people make those claims. You know, random claims of even if they just said, we don't need animal protein, or you know, you can get all this a vitamin, or vegans have lower rates of this, no sources anywhere. Nothing linked in the description, no research. It was happening by the doctors and people who weren't doctors. Of course, Dr. Michael Greger is all about the research and everything. Hi, ah, yes. Woo. Yeah, nutrition facts, or as I call it, nut facts. <laughs> um, yeah, so empirical evidence, at least for me, wins over feels arguments, feeling arguments. But at the same time, feelings matter. And for me, it's the numbers that changed my feelings. And so this is how the numbers turned me vegan and then some numbers that kept me vegan, or that I think are really important for helping people go vegan. So main numbers, you could guess it, these are the areas, health, environment, and the animals, kind of mirrors a little bit of something you're familiar with, the three legs of veganism. Oh, right, so I just pressed something bad, but life is hopefully good. It's still good, we're good, okay. So sources matter. Someone, maybe you have a coworker named Bob, and he says one in 10 vegans die in the first five years. You know, you have a Bob, probably. In fact, one time I was sitting around a campfire and this guy was like, you know, after about 10 years from the lack of animal protein, your face just starts to sag and just fall off. I was like, what? So that's Bob. You know, that's how Bob talks. Bob is not a highly credible source. And I think we would all agree that he's not a highly credible source. And so the reality is, go home, Bob. You know, we need better sources than that. Just one example of a very important source that people use all the time, and I think like, for especially for kids who are like trying to be vegan in their family. Definitely, this is the most important paper out there. This is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the largest group of, of nutrition professionals in the world, the largest organization. A lot of the organizations in different countries also work with them and they, they have the same statement. And you already know it, it's just that an adequately planned vegan diet is suitable for all stages of life. And so that is a higher rated source. Doesn't mean that any source is completely perfect, but this, you know, I think it's over 100,000 nutrition professionals around the world is a little bit more credible than Bob. I think we would go ahead and say that right there. All right, so we're gonna start with those vegan health numbers. And uh, I know this is very much like a, a very animal-centric uh, festival. And for me though, 
I was a selfish person who was, you know, I had the meat goggles on. I couldn't emotionally, you know, get an understanding of what was happening to the animals because I was participating in it. And so for me, I needed to be super selfish and have a reason for me to have an advantage of going vegan or just, you know, maybe prevent some disease, be healthier. And so that is why I was persuaded by the health argument. I'm sure some people were, but I know we have a lot of animal people and I'm jealous of you guys for having the empathy to do that right off the bat. I'm just too selfish, I guess, or just too, just too emotionally blocked off before I was vegan. But now my heart chakra is wide open. <laughs> All right, so number one, your number one fear of death should be dying of a heart attack, any, pretty much anywhere in the world now. All over the world, number one killer, number one killer in the US, although cancer is pretty much catching up. And you know, in the US, 630,000 people and stroke is right there. And we're talking about artery diseases. Those are the scariest diseases. And you know, statistically, we don't hear about them as much. You know, we're, we're more afraid of maybe dying in a plane crash or something that we're probably not gonna die of. And so, it, it gets kind of scary when you actually look at when this starts. We are talking almost every North American child having fatty streaks in their aorta, which is their biggest, biggest artery, by age three. So they're basically toddlers running around the beginnings, the little tricklings of, uh, of heart disease. Uh, it sounds bad. And then later on, fatty streaks begin to appear in the coronary arteries five to ten years later. So what is that, eight to thirteen years old? We're starting to see that in the U.S. So not fun. A lot of bad things happen. And there are so many diseases that happen from the circulatory system being clogged. It's actually incredible. Oh, here's one. Honey, I clogged the kids, for those that can't read. Maybe it's more of an American movie. Um, <laughs> So here's another one that's crazy. So as we grow up, of course, you imagine that those arteries start to clog more and more. And so if you look at healthy heart donors, these are people that would have died in like an accident, the things that were afraid of dying in. And they looked at their arteries for donation. And it gets, you know, what percent of donors had healthy clogged arteries? Raise your hand for 25 or clogged. Had clogged arteries, clogged hearts. 25%, anyone? 33%? 50%? Oh, someone's seen my videos, that's not fair. <laughs> yep, 50% of them. These are the healthy Americans. And their hearts are clogged on many levels. Anyway, so this is the chart and you can see, man, it gets really bad. Even 13 to 19 over there, sorry, 13 to 19 of the uh, you know, people that age, 13, 19 years old, 20% of those were clogged as well, which is scary. All right, so for me, very personal thing was Alzheimer's. My grandma died of Alzheimer's. She lived in our home. It was really intense. It was like, just, you, you know what it's like. It's, it's, it's not something you want to be around, and it's not good for anybody, including the person who has it. And so I was really frustrated when I found about this paper, which was Dr. Alzheimer's paper in 1907, saying the larger vascular tissues showed arteriosclerotic change, which means clogged brain arteries, which no one talks about. And this is kind of gross, look away if you're kind of, kind of sensitive. But uh, as you've probably seen from Dr. Gregor too, these are healthy brain arteries, and these are the brain arteries of someone with Alzheimer's. Not looking great. And so I was starting to show, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go off it, yeah, 1907. You can look up again if you're squeamish. Um, so for me, it was like, oh my gosh, this disease I'm so afraid of getting that I've witnessed in my home, actually has a cause. Obviously there are other causes that happen, you know, the, the the fat in the brain can work with other chemicals like heavy metals and, and make it worse. But you know, there are populations that more or less don't have that. And so there's also the clogged happy artery as I'm gonna call it. And uh, the reality is that erectile dysfunction is in one's 40s is associated with 5,000% heart disease risk in the next 10 years. Because it is the beginning of heart disease. There's the artery comparison. It's small, it's gonna go first. I'm sorry guys, and I will say, I'm going there, and uh, you know, there's maybe a few people you know, that might not want to hear it. But um, a lot of festivals, I've had guys come up to me and be like, hey, I saw your erectile dysfunction video, I had that. We're talking young people, and they're like, I fixed it. So, <laughs> round of applause for those guys. Who are able to recontrol themselves down there. And, <laughs> and it just keeps going. The amount of diseases that are clogged by a messed up circulatory system is actually incredible. This is a award-winning study from longer ago than you think. It was actually 2002. I was like 12. And they found that we had a large incidence of spinal disc degeneration 
in people from 11 to 16 years old. Right there, that is detectable disc degeneration. 11 years old, these are kids. These aren't people who have been working in the coal mine for 30 years and they got their back pain. These are people who are just playing on the playground. It's like, what's going on here? So obviously, as you can tell by this and other things, we have had these clogging issues. And the reason for that, in the back at least, is because we have these fine little capillaries that feed into this disc in your back that doesn't actually have blood directly. Things just diffuse into it. So if anything clogs there, you are done in the back. Over time, you know, get starved of nutrients, and that's what a large portion of back pain is from. All right, and so now we get into diet. Does diet clog arteries? The uh, popular media would probably like to believe, like you to believe, that it has nothing to do with anything. The reality is, thankfully, you know, you know, large organizations. This is, you know, large European uh, European Society of Cardiology saying that there is a relationship, and their update is. Uh, Elevated levels of plasma, LDL, or bad cholesterol are causal to atherosclerosis. And we'll get into some of the deniers of that in a little bit. Fun stuff. And so what do you think the average LDL cholesterol level is in U.S. vegans? Sorry, I'm being very U.S. centric as we typically are as Americans. Um, 67, anybody? Vegan levels? No? No one thinks of vegan levels? Okay. 103? LDL? Sorry, this is like a different unit than you even use. The point is... I'll skip ahead, 67, that's the lowest one. And into millimoles, I probably couldn't do it in my head, I'd probably butcher it, but these are the lowest, they're ideal, and in fact, these are the levels of vegetarians who are getting that saturated fat from, a lot of saturated fat and still cholesterol from animal products, and then your average non-vegan meat eater is at 117. This is your LDL or bad cholesterol. So the causal aspect is way better in vegans, and we even see the founder of the paleo diet Lauren Cordain saying, yeah, optimal levels are 50 to 70. I've never met anybody who eats the paleo diet, which is obviously high meat, low carb, having 50 to 70. Maybe they do, but it's not, it's not normal. And so this is an interesting study that looked at the buildup of plaque in arteries based off those levels. And so right in there, pretty much nothing, pretty much no buildup in uh, artery damage from 50 to 70. That doesn't mean it can't happen, it just means it's happening way, way, way less than people who are up on the scale up to 120 average. You know, average is about the middle there. Very solid amount of artery clogging. And so we have to think about, you know, what is going on with the human system that is resulting in this? Because clearly it's not just like vegans have a better attitude or something, which, you know, <laughs> a lot of people say we're smug, maybe that's what lowers our cholesterol. So 14 and a half pounds of cholesterol is what goes through the average person over the course of their life. That's a lot when you consider we're counting in a very small increment. We're talking like milligrams. And 1,300 pounds of saturated fat, 14,000 pounds of meat, and 44,000 pounds of dairy. So fun stuff. That's all going through your friendly little circulatory system, which you're beating on every day, sadly. Vegan inputs, very different. Very different. We're talking obviously zero pounds of cholesterol because we only get it from animal products. But there are some plant foods that have uh, some saturated fat, but they're looking at like half as much saturated fat, which is huge. It's huge for your arteries. And zero pounds of meat and obviously zero pounds of dairy. Once you've gone vegan, of course, there are people who have had the previous life. And so, are vegans less healthy? We have, you know, 50% lower cancer, 78% lower total risk of diabetes, 60% lower high blood pressure, 42% lower male heart attack risk, this is from the Adventists, and then 15% lower mortality, depending on the study, sometimes they're not statistically significant, because we need more vegans out there. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Loving it, loving the vegan energy. So we have this whole notion that saturated fat is healthy, and that's kind of what what I'm fighting against most of the time, it seems like. Every other video, there's someone saying something crazy about how healthy animal fat is. Of course, we had that famous uh, Eat Butter Time article, or Time cover, which is, you know, pretty insane considering the data, but they, of course, have this low-carb narrative, which is, you know, pretty much dominating a, a certain section of YouTube and, and a lot of the media, and it really is that uh, Ansel Keys, who is, you know, a major dietary player, was wrong. He was wrong that dietary saturated fat and cholesterol, increased cholesterol levels, and then increased heart disease is just all nonsense. You know, people have written books about this. We have, you know, Nina Teicholz and a bunch of low-carb people will literally recite that word for word. They'll say, 
Ansel Keys was wrong. He was, he was a horrible person. And then they'll smear him and say all this crazy stuff when it's like, you'd think he was the devil. But the reality is he was like, eh, it looks like saturated fat causes heart disease. And uh, of course, these people always rely on these industry-funded studies, in particular, one by uh, Siri Torino, and it's funded directly by the National Dairy Council. Fun stuff. So that's where we're getting all the information. You know, the root of this is da the dairy industry getting together and going, how do we make people drink more milk and eat more cheese? Oh, why don't we design studies from the ground up using questionable methods to get the results we want and then put it out into the media and then everyone will feel great about eating our product. So that's where we are. And then of course we have things like the French paradox though, the French ate all of these croissants and butter, they pretty much just took baths and butter and, and yet they live forever and they drink wine and smoke. So yeah, you should start smoking right now. <laughs> so here's a good paper. French paradox and other fallacies. And this was the original chart. Yeah, it did look like, in terms of saturated fat on the y-axis and cholesterol, it looked like France was a little out. It was a little out of the, the, the range. They were eating more saturated fat, yet they're, you know, they were doing better. But the reality is, they just weren't counting deaths properly. They were, they were just getting things wrong, had poor medical records, and the moment you adjust it, down there on the bottom left, they go right up into the line. Sorry, there's no French paradox. Butter causes heart disease, sorry. And just to uh, really nail that home, something you will never hear the low-carb proponents say, is this study. We'll never mention this study, which was a massive meta-analysis of metabolic ward trials where they had people, probably unethical nowadays, uh, in like mental hospitals and things like that, being sort of force-fed certain foods, very morally questionable, not only would this, this would cost a billion dollars to do nowadays ethically and would be unethical the way it was done, uh, but they found this curve, or this line. The more saturated fat you eat, the higher your cholesterol goes. That is the most solid thing that we have. I've never yet to see a good argument against it, so come at me if you have one, low carbers. And then of course we have the cholesterol miss, yeah. But the reality is that uh, it causes inflammation. That's what it does in your artery. It causes inflammation and it creates little uh, sites that explode and cause heart, heart attacks. And, uh, oops, messed <laughs> that up, okay. So let's talk about eggs for a little bit because there's also a huge myth that eating cholesterol won't actually raise your cholesterol. No, it does not, you know, it's a totally separate system. You know, nothing happens. But the reality is this is a meal with no cholesterol. Funny, seven hours later, cholesterol in the y-axis, nothing's happening, you're flatlining. And this is varying degrees of eggs. Boom. You know, just launching up there and imagine the average American just every day just, just bathing in the, in the cholesterol from eggs. Not fun stuff. And so, it's just good news about your bad habits. So, I'm gonna move on a little bit. Of course, we have uh, <laughs> the egg industry, which, again, wants people to eat their food. They want people to eat it. And so they have all of these, all of these papers funded by the Egg Nutrition Study, the Egg Nutrition Center, funded by uh, the Egg Nutrition Center again, funded by eggs, funded by eggs, funded by eggs, keep going, funded by eggs. This is just a, that was just a small portion of the amount that are funded by eggs. So not good, that's the information that we're getting. And a lot of times they'll hack the system, they'll use things like the cholesterol ceiling where they take someone who's already pounding down cholesterol, you know, give them some more cholesterol, but because if you're already way up there, you don't really go higher that much, it's okay. It, they can show that eggs don't raise cholesterol. But if you're down here where a vegan is, and you have some eggs, boom, you're, you're right up there with uh, the standard Americans, you and Bob, just going hard with the eggs. <laughs> and yeah, it's also true that according to the FDA, which is our Food and Drug Administration in the US, it's illegal to advertise eggs as healthy. So, of course, they didn't like that. Outdated labeling rules don't reflect latest science, says United Egg Producers. They can't handle it. And of course, this is the US population, probably hard to read, but 25% of all cholesterol comes from eggs. So those are some numbers that you gotta think a little bit about. Just a little bit. Incredible egg, that's our uh, egg board. And of course we have that exponential connection between egg consumption and carotid plaque that actually mirrors smoking. So on the left we have pack years of smoking, and on the right we have egg yolk years of eating eggs. And you can see it's just clogging more and more and more, that's actually measuring the plaque thickness within an artery. So we have the numbers, 
And one thing, just about my personal story, is I actually grew up eating meat, like most people, but for some reason my family just thought that white meat was super healthy, and red meat, that was the bad one, obviously we know there are things about red meat that are a little worse, like the heme iron, but I thought that it was low cholesterol, that's what I was told my whole life. But looking to the numbers, numbers to the rescue, uh, the reality is that it's pretty much neck and neck, and if you have skin on that chicken, you are way higher than a lot of these red meats. So I was lied to, and I feel cheated. <laughs> um, and then, of course, this brings me to Dr. Esselstyn, who I just talk about way too much. I kind of fanboy Dr. Esselstyn. Round of applause if you know who he is. <laughs> Dr. Caldwell. So he took about 200 people and went, I'm going to put you on a whole food vegan diet. Those people had severe uh, cardiovascular disease. A lot of them had strokes. A lot of them had, had heart attacks. And you've seen it before. They followed him for 12 years and got amazing results, even sooner than that. On the left is blood flow after three weeks, before and after the vegan diet. On the right is a particular case of an inoperable artery clearing up, which is pretty amazing, unto itself. And so yeah, we might, maybe these are just flukes. Maybe they just found a couple people in there that had some artery spasms that went away. I've heard 21 people who quit. They were like, I can't do this vegan thing. I'd rather just YOLO and die. 62% uh, had heart attacks and strokes over the next 12 years. Not a real control group, but a pretty good, pretty good comparison to this 177 people that stuck with the whole food vegan diet with a 0.6% incidence of heart attack and stroke. 100 times less, ladies and gentlemen, and etc. So that's, yeah. So that was one of the major numbers that totally messed with my head and was like, this is clearly the right thing to do if you're afraid of any of these cardiovascular or circulatory diseases. And I didn't even get into, there's so many more of them. You know, we're talking diabetic retinopathy where the vessels in your eyes clog and you go blind. Or how a lot of hair loss can actually be caused by people clogging through your friendly little circulatory system, which you're beating on every day, sadly. Vegan inputs, very different. Very different. We're talking obviously zero pounds of cholesterol because we only get it from animal products. But there are some plant foods that have uh, some saturated fat, but they're looking at like half as much saturated fat, which is huge. It's huge for your arteries. And zero pounds of meat and obviously zero pounds of dairy. Once you've gone vegan, of course, there are people who have had the previous life. And so, are vegans less healthy? We have, you know, 50% lower cancer, 78% lower total risk of diabetes, 60% lower high blood pressure, 42% lower male heart attack risk, this is from the Adventists, and then 15% lower mortality, depending on the study, sometimes they're not statistically significant, because we need more vegans out there. <laughs> <laughs> loving it, loving the vegan energy. So we have this whole notion that saturated fat is healthy, and that's kind of what what I'm fighting against most of the time, it seems like. Every other video, there's someone saying something crazy about how healthy animal fat is. Of course, we had that famous uh, Eat Butter Time article, or Time Cover, which is, you know, pretty insane considering the data, but they, of course, have this low-carb narrative, which is, you know, pretty much dominating a, a certain section of YouTube and, and a lot of the media, and it really is that uh, Ansel Keys, who is, you know, a major dietary player, was wrong. He was wrong that dietary saturated fat and cholesterol, increased cholesterol levels, and then increased heart disease. It's just all nonsense. You know, people have written books about this. We have, you know, Nina Teicholz and a bunch of low-carb people will literally recite that word for word. They'll say, Ansel Keys was wrong. He was, he was a horrible person. And then they'll smear him and say all this crazy stuff when it's like, you'd think he was the devil. But <laughs> the reality is he was like, eh, it looks like saturated fat causes heart disease. And, uh, of course, these people always rely on these industry-funded studies, in particular, one by, uh, Siri Torino, and it's funded directly by the National Dairy Council. Fun stuff. So that's where we're getting all the information. You know, the root of this is the dairy industry getting together and going, how do we make people drink more milk and eat more cheese? Oh, why don't we design studies from the ground up using questionable methods to get the results we want and then put it out into the media and then everyone will feel great about eating our product. So that's where we are. And then of course we have things like the French paradox though. The French ate all of these croissants and butter. They pretty much just took baths in butter and, and yet they live forever and they drink wine and smoke. So yeah, you should start smoking right now. <laughs> So, here's a good paper. Or this line. The more saturated fat you eat, 
the higher your cholesterol goes. That is the most solid thing that we have. I've never yet to see a good argument against it, so come at me if you have one. Low carbers. And then, of course, we have the cholesterol miss, yeah. But the reality is that uh, it causes inflammation. That's what it does in your artery. It causes inflammation, and it creates little uh, sites that explode and cause heart, heart attacks. And, uh, oops, <laughs> messed that up, okay. So, let's talk about eggs for a little bit, because there's also a huge myth that eating cholesterol won't actually raise your cholesterol. No, it does not, you know, it's a totally separate system. You know, nothing happens. But the reality is, this is a meal with no cholesterol. Funny, seven hours later, cholesterol on the y-axis, nothing's happening, you're flatlining. And this is varying degrees of eggs. Boom. You know, just launching up there, and imagine the average American just every day just, just bathing in the, <laughs> in the cholesterol from eggs. Not fun stuff. And so, it's just good news about your bad habits, so I'm gonna move on a little bit. Of course, we have uh, <laughs> the egg industry, which, again, wants people to eat their food. They want people to eat it. And so they have all of these, all of these papers funded by the Egg Nutrition Study, Egg Nutrition Center, funded by uh, the Egg Nutrition Center again, funded by eggs, funded by eggs, funded by eggs, keep going, funded by eggs. This is just a, that was just a small portion of the amount that are funded by eggs. So, not good, that's the information that we're getting. And a lot of times they'll hack the system, they'll use things like the cholesterol ceiling, where they take someone who's already pounding down cholesterol, you know, give them some more cholesterol, but because if you're already way up there, you don't really go higher that much, it's okay. They can show that eggs don't raise cholesterol. But if you're down here where a vegan is, and you have some eggs, boom, you're, you're right up there with uh, the standard Americans, you and Bob, just going hard with the eggs. And yeah, it's also true that according to the FDA, it's our Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., it's illegal to advertise eggs as healthy. So, of course, they didn't like that. Outdated labeling rules don't reflect latest science, says United Egg Producers. They can't handle it. And of course, this is the U.S. population, probably hard to read, but 25% of all cholesterol comes from eggs. So those are some numbers that you got to think a little bit about. Just a little bit. Incredible egg. That's our uh, egg board. And of course, we have that exponential connection between egg consumption and carotid plaque that actually mirrors smoking. So on the left, we have pack years of smoking, and on the right, we have egg yolk years of eating eggs. And you can see it's just clogging more and more and more. That's actually measuring the plaque thickness within an artery. So we have the numbers. And one thing, just about my personal story, is I actually grew up eating meat like most people, but for some reason my family just thought that white meat was super healthy and red meat, that was the bad one, obviously we know there are things about red meat that are a little worse, like the heme iron, but I thought that it was low cholesterol, that's what I was told my whole life. But looking to the numbers, numbers to the rescue, uh, the reality is that it's pretty much neck and neck, and if you have skin on that chicken, you are way higher than a lot of these red meats. So I was lied to, and I feel cheated. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, this brings me to Dr. Esselstyn, who I just talk about way too much. I kind of fanboy Dr. Esselstyn. Round of applause if you know who he is. Dr. Caldwell. So he took about 200 people and went, I'm going to put you on a whole food vegan diet. Those people had severe uh, cardiovascular disease. A lot of them had strokes. A lot of them had heart attacks. And you've seen it before. They followed him for 12 years and got amazing results, even sooner than that. On the left is blood flow after three weeks, before and after the vegan diet. On the right is a particular case of an inoperable artery clearing up, which is pretty amazing, unto itself. And so yeah, we might maybe these are just flukes, maybe they just found a couple people in there that had some artery spasms that went away. I've heard that one a lot, actually. And this is the reality, after 12 years, the 21 people who quit, they were like, I can't do this vegan thing, I'd rather just YOLO and die. 62% uh, had heart attacks and strokes over the next 12 years. Not a real control group, but a pretty good, pretty good comparison to this 177 people that stuck with the whole food vegan diet with a 0.6% incidence of heart attack and stroke. 100 times less, ladies and gentlemen, etc. So that's yeah. 
So that was one of the major numbers that totally messed with my head and was like, this is clearly the right thing to do if you're afraid of any of these cardiovascular or circulatory diseases. And I didn't even get into, there's so many more of them, you know, whatever is within their hair follicle, follicles. It goes on and on and on. But what about protein? I actually went this, you know, this whole time without going deep into protein. Oh, what am I doing? Um, let's just go right into the undeniable numbers. Kendrick Ferris, in terms of the, he was the only one from Team USA in the Olympics that qualified for the Rio Olympics, and he did it by breaking a US record as a vegan with 460 pounds over his head, which, sorry, I don't know how many kilograms, but a lot, just take it for a lot, record breaking. So that was something I just couldn't really deny. Couldn't really deny that, and uh, obviously that was later, or people can't deny it, so I use it all the time, but this is one that really got me going. Like, the one, the time I heard this, I was like, everything I know is a lie, everything I've been told is not true, and these are the blood protein levels of vegans and meat eaters. And vegans are higher. What? How? How? Yeah, yeah, cheer for protein. Cheer. Think about every time Bob said you had a protein deficiency. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, and, um, you know, I even had somebody that recently be like, oh, it's higher because it's a sign of sickness. It's a sign of deficiency that is so high, and it has nothing to do with protein deficiency being higher. The reality is, yes, if you do have a protein deficiency, your serum, serum albumin will be lower. It's free blood protein. And one theory for all of this is just that we have less inflammation. So inflammation actually uses up protein actually gained the 15 pounds and got stronger going vegan, so, yes. <laughs> of course we have the soy thing, but the reality is uh, the largest study on soy meta-analysis shows no hormone changes, even with super duper concentrated levels. So they take those phytoestrogens, plant, not real estrogens, they isolate them, extract them, concentrate them a ton, give that to people directly, and they still don't change their levels of those hormones. So that is something that's really undeniable to me. And we also, this is, this is a, uh, yeah, okay. If soy gave you boobs, plastic surgeons would go out of business. That's the reality. That's not enough. Um, but the reality is that the numbers don't favor it. We have, you know, you might get some short-term benefits. You know, you might burn off all the glycogen in your system, lose some water weight, get that immediate burst of weight loss and feel really good about yourself. And, and some people do, you know, they do okay on it. They do, they, they do better than they might have been doing. But reality is increased mortality risk by 30%, according to a meta-analysis, uh, that one right there. And that, I mean, think about that. Imagine if a vegan diet study was like, you're gonna have a 30% increased chance of dying. We would have no argument. And of course we have, you know, the lower mortality, and yet this is still what people push and they're lying to you if they're saying that their brand of the low-carb diet, their high-meat, high-fat, zero-carb diet, is any different than these. They're just remixes of Atkins. And of course we have an increased animal and environmental footprint from that. And just wait, we'll get to those sections soon. And this is an example of what somebody might eat on a keto diet. This was MCT oil, which is straight saturated fat, chicken, heavy cream, in between there's some plants, but cheese, butter, 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 cheese, coconut oil. Not a good thing. And so I was still surprised by this number, even after that. This is a guy who's watching my channel, he was eating keto for six months, and his fasting cholesterol was 440, which again, you don't have those numbers, but we're talking the average American is 220, about, it's around 200. And so we're twi he was twice the standard American. Of course, after going plant-based, he says, up down to 150 on a vegan diet. It's pretty much ideal. So, <laughs> round of applause for Eoin. I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> and of course, keto it just has a ton of crazy, this is from the literature uh, that a PhD nutrition researcher, who is a low-carb proponent, but is like, hey, we should talk about the risks. All of the things, you probably can't even read them, we're talking gastrointestinal disturbances, inflammation risk, thinning hair, kidney stones, muscle cramps, hypoglycemia, low platelet count, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Impaired mood, it goes all the way down, nutrition deficiency, that's a funny one, little projection there. Cardiomyopathy, which is a heart issue, myocardial infarction, heart attack, and death. These are studies on children. Uh -huh.
You know, I even had somebody recently be like, oh, it's higher because it's a sign of sickness. It's a sign of deficiency that is so high. And it has nothing to do with protein deficiency being higher. The reality is, yes, if you do have a protein deficiency, your serum, serum albumin will be lower. It's free blood protein. And one theory for all of this is just that we have less inflammation. So inflammation actually uses up protein. It creates C-reactive protein within your body. And so you have this free, free protein going throughout your bloodstream. Your body goes, oh, I got some inflammation in my knee or whatever, so I'm gonna create some C-reactive protein out of these building blocks. Levels might go down. That's the theory. And of course, vegans have 30% lower C-reactive protein. 30% less inflammation on average. And this study not only looked at vegans and saw their levels, but they took people who weren't vegan, put them on a vegan diet, and that's what they saw, about 30% lower. So we're rocking the inflammation. Hormones are also another one, because you know, we have this meat manliness thing, where you know, if you're not eating meat, you're not a man, you got a barbecue with the bros. And so it gets you a little, you know, it gets guys a little insecure. I thought like, oh, the moment I give up meat, you know, I'm just gonna shrivel up, I'm not gonna be able to lift anything. And so, of course, that was wrong. I actually gained the 15 pounds and got stronger going vegan, so, yes. <laughs> of course, we have the soy thing, but the reality is uh, the largest study on soy meta-analysis shows no hormone changes, even with super-duper concentrated levels. So they take those phytoestrogens, plant, not real estrogens, they isolate them, extract them, concentrate them a ton, give that to people directly, and they still don't change their levels of those hormones. So that is something that's really undeniable to me. And we also, this is, this is a, yeah, okay. If soy gave you boobs, plastic surgeons would go out of business. That's the reality. That's not a number, but I think it's a very valid point. And of course, vegans have free equivalent Equivalent free testosterone and higher levels of total testosterone, according to this study. So there's more man in the system. So not only do vegans have the higher protein levels, they also have the higher testosterone levels, at least in terms of their system, and equivalent. And if you've seen Hench Herbivore walking around, where is he? He's, yeah, then you know there's, there's all the man in that system. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, and then, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's a reason for this. We don't really know completely. But uh, we do know that drinking dairy, you know, that's a cocktail of mammalian hormones. But soy, be afraid of soy. The reality is from this study though, when they gave people some cow's milk, which is that, <laughs> they had about a 20% statistically significant increase in estrone, which is a type of estrogen, and about a 20% lowering of testosterone. So if there's anything you should be afraid of drinking, it's not soy milk, it's the cow boob the fact. Yes. <laughs> Round of applause for no cow boo. So um, another big thing that's just really interesting, we're always talking about weight loss and everyone, a lot of people want to lose weight, especially in the U.S. We have a major obesity epidemic and it's, it's hard to talk about too. I try to not talk about it too much. It's a very uh, like internal thing as well, but a huge part of that is, is just the amount of processed foods versus the amount of fiber that's going into your body. And the reality is in the US, I'm not even gonna play the game this time, what percent of Americans don't get the recommended amount of fiber, I'll just hop right to it. 97% are having a really hard time on the toilet. If you've been to the US, you'll see constipation ads everywhere, and it's just not good. And we, we know it's from fiber, I don't even need to flash three or four studies about why why having fiber helps you poop, but it does. And that's also creating a healthy gut transition as well when you're going vegan. Because not only does fiber transfer into some short chain fatty acids that actually tell your body it's full, a natural mechanism for fullness, in addition to the volume, it's also helping that gut biome, which is super interesting, and I love learning about the gut biome, I think we all do. And this was the vegan diet they put them on, put people on, you can see massive increase in fiber, that little jump up in fiber on the plant-based diet they had there for two weeks, and a crashing in fiber on the animal diet they had. And this is a study that found that shifting people onto an animal-based diet rapidly changed their gut microbiome for the worst, more, poten more potentially pathogenic bacteria came out. And, yeah, those are potentially capable of trigger triggering inflammatory bowel disease, which is another major issue in the Western world. 
And we also have more of those protective species, which is cool, and less of that E. coli. We all know about E. coli, and I could talk about the gut forever, but I think we might as well move on to the result of this, the result of eating the more fiber, the result of having that natural appetite trigger, which I will say, you know, vegan foods are getting a little bit better at being processed. It's kind of a slippery slope. Like, it might not be this in the future. But uh, as of now in the US, vegans are the only that average normal BMI, which is just a good health measure. It doesn't always mean everything. It's one health measure, I should say. You know, someone can be super jacked and above the normal BMI. But that's huge. I mean, that's the epidemic. You know, obesity contributes to a variety of cancers as well. And so that's it right there. Even, you know, as you go up, the more animal products you eat, the less fiber you eat, the heavier somebody ends up. And this is another amazing study that came out of New Zealand. The Broad Study, but I, I think it should be called the Broad Study. And uh, it was a whole food vegan intervention actually using, they like showed them forks over knives and showed them how to eat. And they got, got together and did potlucks, like all the stuff some of you probably do with your vegan friends. And according to them, to the best of their knowledge, it was the greatest weight loss at six and 12 months compared to any other trial that did not limit energy intake and add exercise. And the result, to a number, 26 pounds in six months. Sorry, I don't know how many stone that is, but uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of money. <laughs> and so, going back to this though, you know, I, you know, when I was trying to decide, you know, what's a good diet to prevent disease, why didn't I just go on a low carb diet? I heard all these people saying, oh, you know, low carb diet will fix all your problems. It, you know, some people are even like, keto cures cancer and all that stuff, kind of a dangerous claim. Um, <laughs> But the reality is that the numbers don't favor it. We have, you know, you might get some short-term benefits. You know, you might burn off all the glycogen in your system, lose some water weight, and get that immediate burst of weight loss and feel really good about yourself. And, and some people do, you know, they do okay on it. They do, they, they do better than they might have been doing. But the reality is increased mortality risk by 30%, according to a meta-analysis, uh, that one right there. And that, I mean, think about that. Imagine if a vegan diet study was like, you're gonna have a 30% increased chance of dying. We would have no argument. And of course we have you know, the lower mortality, and yet this is still what people push and they're lying to you if they're saying that their brand of a low carb diet, their high meat, high fat, zero carb diet is any different than these. They're just remixes of Atkins. And of course we have an increased animal and environmental footprint from that. And just wait, we'll get to those sections soon. And this is an example of what somebody might eat on a keto diet. This was from the studies on epilepsy, you know? Ketogenic pudding, who knows what that is? You know, you got cream cheese eggs, heavy cream, heavy cream, MCT oil, which is straight saturated fat, chicken, heavy cream, in between there's some plants, but cheese, butter, 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 cheese, coconut oil. Not a good thing. And so I was still surprised by this number, even after that. This is a guy who's watching my channel. He was eating keto for six months and his fasting cholesterol was 440, which again, you don't have those numbers, but we're talking the average American is 220, about, it's around 200. And so we're twi he was twice the standard American. Of course, after going plant-based, he says, uh, down to 150 on a vegan diet, which is pretty much ideal. So, <laughs> round of applause for Eoin, I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> And of course, keto it just has a ton of crazy, this is from the literature uh, that a PhD nutrition researcher, who is a low carb proponent, but is like, hey, we should talk about the risks. All of the things, you probably can't even read them, we're talking gastrointestinal disturbances, inflammation risk, thinning hair, kidney stones, muscle cramps, hypoglycemia, low platelet count. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Impaired mood, it goes all the way down. Nutrition deficiency, that's a funny one. Little projection there. Cardiomyopathy, which is a heart issue, myocardial infarction, heart attack, and death. These are studies on children. And uh, yeah, here's an example of cardiac complications on children. Uh, really not good, because that's, you know, is an epilepsy treatment. And I cross-referenced two studies, this, uh, the kidney stone incidence in these children and the average incidence between normal children. They had a thousand times the kidney stone rate of normal children. So there's a number where, you know, numbers like that might deter you from going on a, on a ketogenic diet right there. All right, so let's get on to the environmental. I could talk about health all day, but there's so much more and there's more stuff going on right now I'll try and touch on a little bit. But uh, right there, this is one I get a lot because I live in Iowa, where none of you know where it is. Raise your hand if you know where Iowa is. 
Oh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Okay. Cool. I accept that. It's in the Midwest. And my state of Iowa has seven times as many pigs as people. And I have talked to pig farmers. In fact, one time, maybe I'll have time for the story. I was in a bar late at night around like the holidays. And these guys come up and they're like, hey, we go to your university. Aren't we cool? Blah, blah, blah. I was just like hanging out with us. They're like, yeah, whatever. And then they're like, actually, we don't go to your university. We are factory pig farmers. And see, you don't hate us after all. Really interesting way to meet somebody. Um, he was just trying to prove that they were people, but we got an argument, and his main thing, and I hear it over and over again from the Iowa pig farmers and pig farmers in general and animal factory farmers, that we need to feed the world with meat, which is pretty laughable if you really do the math, especially because from the FAO, almost 50% of the world's grains goes to livestock, throwing away like half, almost half of our calories. And this is in the US, that's a land usage pie chart. Everything on the left of that is land use in the lower 48 states for animal agriculture. And it just goes to a pretty small portion of calories, way smaller than half. So this is throwing away all of this food, and that's a visual representation if that was the land that we used to grow meat. So that is not, that's not a healthy way, that's not an efficient way to feed the world right there, especially how little it's producing in terms of calories. And globally, we're using about 30% of ice, the ice-free land on the Earth. You've probably heard these from Cowspiracy. And that's from this study. But the reality is that a vegan diet, you know, this is, I have to laugh because this study was actually used to try and smear a vegan diet. Because the idea was that, oh, you can actually, you can have a few more people because the vegan model is so efficient that if you then fish a couple fish or graze on some, un, you know, some land you can't grow on, then you'll get more calories. So you have a full vegan model with like a couple little animal calories. And the reality is they, you know, they were classifying really arable land as unarable land, and I go a whole video about that. Pretty much everything here I have a whole video about, in case you're wondering. And the reality is though, this chart, vegans are way on the right. That's the amount of land used per person, hectares per person per year. Way less. That is not how you feed the world over there. I am sorry. We have a limited amount of space on this planet. That's the vegans. And then, of course, in terms of the, uh, Farm animals, this is one that really blew my mind in terms of a number, is the ratio now of farm animal biomass to wild mammal biomass. Let's, let's take some guesses. Let's, let's have some fun on this one. Raise your hand if you think it's two to one. Raise your hand if you think it's eight to one. You guys know my formula now. <laughs> it's 14 to one, yeah. It's not good at all, 14 to one, so we have 14 times as many farm animals in terms of biomass than we have wild animals. So it's not looking good. And of course, biodiversity uh, is huge right now and our extinction issues are huge, especially with the Amazon. And uh, from this study, it's likely, eating meat is likely the leading cause of species extinction, which is pretty credible. And then of course we get no people coming out saying, actually lettuce is three times worse for, for the environment than bacon. Do you remember that? So that's a number. That's, that's, it's interesting talking about numbers that might not actually be true. That's a whole other issue. And of course, this was just a spin. If you actually look at it, they did calorie per calorie. So oh yeah, if you eat like several heads of lettuce or a few strips of bacon, that's, that's how we compare food, not serving sizes. And this is <laughs> just to show how off they were. Kilogram of consumed food consumed versus CO2 emissions. Everything on the right is plants. Everything on the left is animal-based. End of discussion. And here's a study out of the UK, actually. And this is, I, in my opinion, a very uh, you know, modest study. They probably didn't look into everything like carbon sequestration of lands that are cut down to grow animal products. But the vegan diet one, and a newer one, Oh, not a new one. Yeah, so we're looking at, of course, 14 to 51, depending on the, uh, the presentation that we have, is the total percentage of greenhouse gases emitted by the livestock industry from these two FAO reports. And of course, it reduces our ability to sequester carbon from all that stuff. So here's another one. I had a recent video on that UN report that came out. Of course, you had everyone going, oh my gosh, you gotta go vegan now because this is the chart. This is if the whole world went vegan, with more people on the planet over several decades and the vegan diet won with the most greenhouse gases saved. The best way to fight climate change with diet is a vegan diet. Yes. Okay.
Thank you. And of course, I will. I, I do know people. You know, we have the Alan Savories of the world, who is, uh, you know, wants to save the world by grazing livestock, <laughs> uh, and of course, it's grass-fed beef. Uh, but the reality is, even looking at grass-fed versus grain-fed, grass-fed emit three times more methane than grain-fed cows. All that grass digestion ends up burping up. It's mainly burping. Contrary to popular belief, it's not farting. And that's the study. Three and a half times as much. And we also it takes. 30% to 100% longer to reach slaughter weight or murder weight for these cows. So it's just inefficient all around the world. Amazon destruction. As we know now, this is in majorly in the headlines, Amazon being on fire and so forth. And I'm sure you all already know this by now, but in case one person in here doesn't, 80%, um, <laughs> probably you know, average of 80% of the de deforestation is from animal ag and it's for feeding or clearing crops, and it's because these cattle ranchers are burning down the Amazon on purpose, often illegally, to clear land to graze livestock. So we need to get on that. Not only do we need to shout it from the rooftops, we also need to be thinking about ways to legislate, and they, the government of Brazil, I believe, has already denied aid to help fight that, which is annoying. Whole nother issue, whole nother presentation, but this is what it looks like, you know, once we have that, and it gets cut down into this. So, fun stuff. <laughs> okay, so it's also in terms of the water. We have um, this main threat to coral reefs uh, where 25% of marine life is, which is pretty crazy. We have these big trawling ships that go through and do a lot of damage. So, from this report, and our main threat to whales is actually not whaling. It's fishing for other fish which is absolutely messed up. And that's that paper. So I'm gonna move a little forward because we're almost out of time. But approximately 30% of human derived carbon, or yeah, is sequestered in the ocean. So everything we're pooping out, emitting out, throwing out, the ocean is helping that. And a really cool fact is that whales are doing a lot of that. Whales actually go in and they fertilize the ocean. And so fishing kills the whales, they don't fertilize the ocean, get the phytoplankton out there to suck that carbon back in and save the planet. All right, and of course, all of this, you know, is the most inconvenient truth. Neither of Al Gore's inconvenient truth movies really talked about this, and it was because it was too inconvenient. It's too bad. So let's move on to the animal numbers. So, in four minutes, we're gonna do this. Uh, the animal numbers are really one of the major things that helped me stay vegan, especially because once I had those meat goggles off, my eyes were open to the reality. I wasn't participating anymore. And of course we have a lot of people coming in saying, oh, you know what, actually vegans kill more animals, you know what? Yeah, all those little rodents running around, all those combines, they're actually killing more than grass-fed beef and, and other animals. And the reality is that no, these are the actual deaths of just crop harvesting. All of the lower ones are plants, the higher ones are animal products, and then this is adding the actual deaths of killing the animals, something they sometimes forget to count, conveniently. Oh, and then this is the feed conversion ratio. So this is, if you take one pound, to get one pound of these animals out, you are throwing away all of this food, again, going back to why half of the grains in the world, up to half the grains, are fed to livestock. So dairy doesn't hurt cows is a major, major myth that I see all the time. And the reality is, it does, and I think we know that, and I think a lot of the presentations here are gonna do a lot better job of, of explaining why. But this is one statistic that definitely shook me, and it's the reality that in the US, that, sorry, I pressed the button, that 97% of calves are removed from their mothers within the first 24 hours of life, and that that is considered humane. To produce milk, you need these animals to be pregnant, and when they're pregnant, they will have calves and a lot of them will be male, and a lot of them will go off to the dairy industry, and they will just be taken away. And so there's no way to not hurt cows. And just some fun, some fun facts of how ignorant we are, why we don't pay attention to these things. It's just because we don't want to look at it. 7% of Americans believe that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. That's a dairy industry figure. So this is a little bit of the ignorance we're working with. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> wish me luck. Telling people science. Here's another one. 
40% of children 9 to 12 years old don't know that beef comes from cows. That is incredible. This is a designed, you know, orchestrated effort to make sure that nobody is actually seeing the reality of the situation. Their eyes are covered, the slaughterhouses are far away. We talk about slaughterhouses with glass walls, but you've heard all that. The reality is we're just trying to deny it, and numbers are a powerful way to break down the barriers. So the myth is our entire view of animal agriculture, pasture, free range, all that stuff, but the reality is that even grass-fed cows are often fed grass pellets in factory farms on feedlots. And we raise and slaughter 50 to 70 billion land animals per year. This fantasy of these open pastures is not possible. And of course we have this humane slaughter myth, which is completely insane, which can be, in my opinion, fully debunked by the numbers, in case you can't tell that killing an animal against their will isn't bad enough. Uh, we have the natural lifespans on the left of these animals, and you can see that they're killed, you know, pretty much in infancy or toddler age. They're really not good. So no, not only does no animal want to die against their will, but no young animal is living out their life in peace. And, and it's just, it's all a myth. No matter, no matter which number you look at, it kind of breaks down the, breaks down the fantasy. So yeah, we're literally eating children, and there's no way to humanely kill them. Here's another one, is that animals aren't sentient. This is huge. The one number around this, which I think is really interesting, just as, just as like a fact that is like, wow, we are so anthropocentric, we are so human focused, we think we're so great. But from the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, they had neuroscientists, neuroanatomists, Stephen Hawking was there, trying to figure out whether animals are conscious. And one, one uh, figure they had was that the African gray parrot has the consciousness level of a three and a half year old human being. Which is amazing. And I don't think all animals need to be as smart as us or comparably smart as us as us to not kill them. How about that? Basic, you know, basic uh, emotional ethics. But uh, I thought it was a pretty amazing fact. And in conclusion of their paper, convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrates of conscious states along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. So we are not alone. <laughs> in the universe and conscious beings are on our planet already. How about that? In conclusion, don't be Bob. For those of you who were here in the beginning, yeah, Bob is just the person who just says stuff. He just says, hey, here's, here's something that I think is real. Here's no numbers. Here's no research. Here is no good sources. And so I don't have time for questions, but basically I just want to say, that numbers were what were able to break open my heart from being a selfish meat eater dude to being able to see the reality of the situation, not just selfishly as to how a vegan diet would help me prevent, you know, the diseases I most feared, but that they would also help the environment and that it would also help the animals. All right, thank you very much.